hi everyone. My name is PK and here I have Simon Quiston Mecca, who I'm super grateful to have on the show today because like he's someone that I've no, no one I've actually talked to fits his profile. Like he's an author, he's an economist, he's a co-founder at the demographics group, he's a media commentator, has been on the project, all that sort of thing. But the things that well, the thing that admires or I admire the most about him is that he just swims in data. Like I was telling this to him before we hit record, like much like me, he's a connoisseur of data and charts and maps. He's written a book, he's writing a book about that as well. And I just thought in this episode, we talk about the next five, next 10, maybe next 15 years of real estate in the Australian context with the lens or with the perspective of demographics, of population, of people. Uh, I've never talked about this in the past, so I'm really excited to do it. Welcome to the Oz Property Investment Mastery Podcast. My name's PK and I help busy people build passive income by buying top 5% growth and cash flow property and build a portfolio using data without wasting months doing research, spending weekends at inspection or catching flights or dropping ten dollars to $20,000 on buyer's agents every single time. So if you're confused, lack confidence and just overwhelmed with all the information and marketing misinformation available online and don't know where to start, then this show is for you. Thank you so much, Simon, for making time and being with me. That's been a big pleasure. <laughs> well, look, I'm really excited, actually. So the first question, and, and we'll go through different things, guys. But the first question I wanted to ask is, you know, obviously, in the long term, population has a big impact on house prices and housing market in general. There's no doubt about that. From a demographics perspective, like what are the population forecasts? What are the nuances in there and what's likely to be their impact on Australia's housing market? Well, the first comment here is about why do we bother about forecasts? Simply because no industry is that directly linked to demographics, then there's housing. If you have more people um, in the country, you need more boxes to put those people in. And then depending on what kind of age, what kind of income structure, what kind of job those people have, then you need to add adequate housing stock. And if you kind of guess, kind of know what is coming, you can invest into the right suburbs and into the right types of houses that people might want to be interested in. And you want to understand the age profile and the size of the population. The size of the population um, is good, excellent news in Australia. We are growing. We have been growing at right around 300 to 400,000 people per year over the last couple of decades. That is very, very strong growth. Two thirds of this population growth comes from migrants from overseas, which is why migration is such a big topic in Australia um, at all times. But um, the population isn't evenly distributed across the whole age spectrum. It goes ups and downs because every now and then you have heaps of people being born. The baby boomers born um, just after the end of the Second World War, they were a really, really big generation. Um, and they changed the way that housing operated because you had so many of them. But also economics uh, were kind to the Australian people back then. And people could just afford homes. Plus, this was the time when women joined the workforce as well. So you went from one household income to one and a half or two household incomes. And all of a sudden you could turbocharge this and people then went from the inner suburbs, they went to the sprawling outer newly developed suburbs and bought those quarter acre blocks that are nowadays being um, you know, subdivided uh, quite frequently. Um, that drove demographics for a bit. Their generation of kids are called the millennials, born in the 80s and 90s, and they are now having kids. So you see there's ups and downs. So you always say a big generation creates another big generation. They create another big generation, even though each generation gets a bit smaller, bit by bit, because birth rates shrink, because we just have fewer babies. And if we look at the forecasts, you always go, well, how the hell do we know what the future looks like? That's a bit tricky. Um, but we have a really clear understanding in demographics of how many babies are being born every year. We also have a clear understanding of how many people die 
every year. So we get what is called natural increase figures, right? So we know, we know how much Australia is growing just on births and deaths because we have more babies born than people die in one and we grow a bit. Um, but we also dictate how many people we let into the country. At the moment, we are still in a position where we can pick and choose who comes to Australia because we offer still a good deal to many people. And so they want to come here. And so we created a bit of a system to decide who's allowed to come here. We let any international student in who is uh, talented enough and uh, who has enough money to pay for their education. They're economically speaking a great deal. One in six of those international students will later on become a permanent resident. And we have a skilled migration list. The skilled migration list really functions like the Uber Eats app. You put a certain item, a hamburger on the app, and it gets delivered magically to your doorstep. This is how the skilled migration list operates. You type in um, IT software developer. You put in structural engineer, and you say maybe 500 of those structural engineers. And once uh, we let 500 structural engineers into the country, we take them off the list. And they immediately pop up in our workforce, a dream come true. So that's how we know how many people are coming. So the number, the, it's called the net overseas migration figure. That just means how many migrants come into the country additionally every single year. If you want to get the forecast right, you just have to have an opinion about how high this number is. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, there are two main forecasts competing against each other. The UN population division has a figure um, and they arrive at about 29 million people in 10 years time, um, which is about 900,000, close to a million people lower than the other forecast that is currently floating around from the treasury in Australia. They have a little thing called the Center for Population, and they came up with a forecast that is 900,000 people higher. So you go, wait a second, why are those two forecasts so far apart? How, how can this change? And it's only about, they have the same assumptions of births, the same assumptions of deaths, really. There's no there's give or take, doesn't matter much. The difference here isn't about how many people do we think will come to Australia. The UN says, the UN undershoots the figure, to be honest. They think because those forecasts were done during the pandemic, Australia is a bit unpopular, people don't want to come, fair enough. And then the treasury figures, they are always overshooting the target a tiny bit, simply because treasury has a um, bit of an interest in mm. writing themselves a really high number of migrants into their budget papers, because that means ultimately that they can hand out more money in their budget papers. So the treasurer always wants a very high number of migrants. Um, to be creating lots and lots of GDP so that they can invest more money into nice things that people might yeah. vote for. And the difference is only about people in their 20s. And that is super important. People in their 20s are economically outrageously um, attractive. They're productive, economically speaking, but they don't cost much. If you know the, the income profile of somebody in their 20s, it is much lower than somebody in their 40s or 50s, even though they're already reasonably economically productive. So it's really nice to have more and more of those people in the country because that creates wealth, economically speaking. So that's mm -hmm. about those two forecasts. But it also, of course, changes the housing market. People in their 20s are renters. They don't have families yet. That means they need um, two-bedroom apartments or thereabouts in commutable distance to their place of work. Unless they work from home, maybe then they're willing to move a bit further uh, out to secure a cheaper dwelling. Um, if you are of the opinion that there are going to be heaps of people in their 20s, you should invest into apartments near major job centers. Absolutely. If you think we're running out of people in their 20s, you should not invest into apartments in their 20s. So that uh, the apartments in the in the commuting uh, inner cities uh, type areas. So this little number, just as a bit of a line that goes a bit further up in one spreadsheet than in the other, that really should have um, a big impact on how you invest your money. Right. Well, the, the thing that struck out to me when you were sharing those numbers is that although that difference between the two sources is quite large, 900,000 
it's still going from where are we at now? 25 million ish? Uh, up 26, to, yeah. 26. Oh, there you go. So it's going from 26 to either 29 or close to 30. It, so it's still yeah. going up in the next 10 years by 4 million, which as a percentage of 26 is, is I would say in 10 years time, it's quite, is it quite large oh. or should it be larger given history? Exactly. So we are still a growth economy. The pie keeps growing. We need more housing. That is definitely true. Perfect. So that is great news. It also means that we clearly need to have a plan of how to create more housing. Because one major problem in Australia is that the net migration figures, so the skilled migration list and the targets of how many people we let into the country, uh, this is a separate set of policies than housing policies. Right. Those two housing, those two policies should always be developed in lockstep. You cannot have the treasurer say, yeah, whatever, we'll take in 50,000 more migrants than we kind of thought, um, because that'd be great to drive the economy. Wonderful. And it is. It does really drive up GDP, um, jobs get filled, whatever. It's great. Um, but we create absolute dramatic housing crises if we don't have um, enough boxes being built to put yeah. those people in. And that's so why we're is. in that situation that we are right now, right? Because this conversation that you're saying wasn't had four years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago? Much longer ago, much longer ago. And that leads to another topic that we should probably talk about. That's the, um, you know, the, the changing income profile of Australians. If you picture the income profile of Australia, you might picture a beautiful bell curve. Sure, there are a couple of rich folks. Sure, there are a couple of poor folks. But more than anything, we all have middle class incomes, middle class jobs, and we have middle class uh, dreams. Well, what you're thinking of here is called the 1970s. <laughs> By now, the Australian workforce much more resembles a letter U, where we have many, many high income jobs. Many, many low income gig economy jobs where you're being paid by the hour, by the item, by the kilometer. But the number of people in middle class jobs is actually shrinking. Technically speaking, they're called skill level three jobs out of five skill levels that exist in the workforce classification. And they only make up 14 percent or thereabouts of the workforce right now. And so you create this letter U shape where you have fewer and fewer people sitting in the center. That is a general truism about any kind of business decision. Blindly targeting the center of the market is absolutely smart and intelligent in a bell curve environment. Mm -hmm. If you have a U-shape environment, targeting the center of the market is the single dumbest thing you can do. We're increasingly in this scenario. So you want to be clear who you're servicing in the income spectrum. Growth is occurring on both ends of the income spectrum. At the high end of the housing market, you also get high margins. At the bottom end of the housing uh, market, you get low margins. So you can pick and choose where you where you sit. And one of the affordability problems that we have here is that we don't have enough builders. We don't have enough investment. We don't have enough land floating around to service absolutely everyone. So therefore, the market naturally first services the attractive chunks of the housing puzzle, the top end of the market. Then it will slowly sort through the shrinking but still existing middle end of the market and who's servicing the bottom end of the market well it's not the free market at the moment because margins are low theoretically you could have a publicly owned housing developer operate there and build social housing build key worker housing that would be a way is that happening at the moment no who else could be doing things well the only actor that is currently servicing this market are the titans of industry. These are big, fat companies that desperately need low-income workers but they locally, but they know that they can't afford to live there, so they need to develop or purchase housing themselves. This is really like the titans of industry in Industrial Revolution England, where the uh, big uh, capitalists built a factory, and then they needed to build a city next to it because otherwise those um, subsistence farmers wouldn't come from the villages to the cities. That's dire. So they, the, currently the bottom end of the market and the humans uh, that need houses uh, on, on the low income, low rental uh, end of the spectrum, they suffer massively. So is it but, a fair assumption, Simon? I, I definitely don't want to put words in your mouth, but 
trying to piece together the puzzle and connect the dots, is it a fair inference to say because the developer's margin for building inexpensive housing uh, is so thin, therefore less and less of that is being built? That's exactly what you're saying. Therefore, as we transform, evolve as a society five years from now, 10 years from now, there's more and more people in that side of the distribution curve, you know, people on the lower end of the spectrum, there's a lot more of them, more demand, but hardly any stock. Therefore, those affordable locations, if you want to use that word, or inexpensive housing types, those are the ones that have will have the the biggest divide between demand and supply and therefore upward price pressure? Like, I know that's a long, I've just kind of... <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So, so there. What this is certainly doing is that it further divides society and that it further sorts society, segregates society into rich areas and poor areas, if, if, if you will. Mm-hmm. And therefore, a measure like the national median house price becomes increasingly ridiculous. A measure like a median house price is median just means half the houses cost more, half the houses cost less. That's all that median is. Um, in a bell curve environment, that's really interesting. In a U shape environment, it's stupid because the high income earners, they would forever look down on a median income house. And the low income earners, they could never ever even dream of affording a median income house. So the measure itself is a bit silly. Um, so you'd only want to really worry about the measure of median prices if you look at a very specific geography um, with a specific um, housing type. Uh, That then becomes interesting. It is a measure whether to see it goes up or down. That's somewhat interesting. But increasingly, you should not worry about this so much. You want to make sure um, you look at this in combination with other measures. At the very least, uh, measure affordability in things like um, how many median incomes does a median house cost? That's a bit more, bit yeah. more meaningful in that sense. Mm-hmm. And and there are always markets within markets, and there's so much nuance. It's hard to generalize using averages or medians or means or anything like this. But what, one sort of follow up question for my own interest actually is the Sydney property market. Of course, even within Sydney, there's yeah. unlimited property markets. But there's sort of a school of thought that Sydney as a city is almost isolated because it's like a world city, regardless of what happens to Australia. There is so much wealth in Sydney. There is so much wealth that comes into Sydney from global organisations, from global immigration into Sydney. Most migrants come into Sydney, Melbourne, etc., that, you know, that will just, house prices in Sydney will just keep going up, 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 regardless of interest rates, regardless of inflation, regardless of inequality, regardless of cost of living. I'm just trying to to marry these two schools of thought. One is cost of living is so high in Sydney, you know, house prices are so high, affordability is so low. Those things suggest that Sydney house prices over the long term, I'm talking 5, 10, 15 years here, will languish. The other school of thought is it's a wealthy city. People in Sydney are wealthy, or even if they're not, according to that distribution curve, there's enough that are or there's enough that will come in that will always buoy up the property market, increase property prices, snap up all those cheaper properties even. But (laughs) what's your kind of perspective on these things? A couple of comments. So Sydney is, of course, difficult to talk about because it's such a big, fat beast of over 5 million people, that's difficult. So there are endless markets um, in there. But we're increasingly seeing the curse of paradise creeping in there. Um, A market where this is really clear would be something like Byron Bay, um, Sorrento, Margaret River. These are markets that are just beautiful, wonderful dream locations. And so um, for a long time, retirees dreamt of of settling down there. Once they were free of the shackles of their CBD office towers, they could just um, move there. Wonderful. Then along comes the pandemic. Working from home becomes a thing. And many workers, or at least enough workers, can work from home, can work from anywhere. These people then all of a sudden also choose lifestyle destinations. Then those paradise cities, your Byron Bay's, those rich newbies, they price out current local people, 
particularly low income renters first, then low income homeowner, uh, low, then higher income renters, and eventually homeowners or people that can't enter the home market. So all of a sudden, those rich folks live in this beautiful place, but they move there with the idea of having all those affordable services available to them. But they're not because they priced out all those locals. And why would those locals commute a long distance to work um, in paradise in Byron Bay if they find a job that pays just as much down the road? So they don't do that. So it's the curse of paradise. And then that means eventually a city like Byron Bay has to solve their affordability crisis on the lower end of the market. Um, this goes so far as um, hotel owners in Byron Bay bulldozing a bit of their land and building staff accommodation on there. That's what's happening. Now we'll take that back to Sydney. What is happening in Sydney? If you look at Sydney Harbour sites, the uh, most marvelous looks you could uh, dream up, uh, wonderful stuff. Those prices will go up forever. This is like inner city London. Um, this will forever attract um, uh, legal and illegal international capital, <laughs> people that buy into the top end of the market. Um, don't worry about it. That'll be absolutely fine. But then increasingly, those people will need to pay for their services. They just dream of having mm -hmm. enough people cleaning their homes, serving their coffees, um, walking their dogs, all these things. So that means they need, they need to accept increasingly um, affordable key worker housing, whatever you might want to call it. Um, and that completely goes against the current grain of urban um, planning, not urban planning, really the way that urban planning is enforced. Urban planning kind of wants key accommodation, um, but the way that Australia operates is we are really pushing for nimbyism in councils. If you are a local council, which of course have a lot of uh, power in blocking um, development, any local councillor would be dumb, absolutely stupid, to ever okay any type of development because the local neighbors that are currently the voters that keep you employed, um, they would always hate you for it. You would only do a benefit to a future population that is not there yet, that is not voting for you yet. So you will forever block everything. This is why we have nimbyism across all 550 of our local government areas in this country. Uh, it's a structural, it's a systemic issue. And as long as we don't uh, utilize a systemic um, lever, as soon as we don't change systemically that we take power away from those local government areas, nothing will change. How easy is it to wrestle away power from 550 local government areas? Well, it's political suicide. So therefore, I don't expect anyone to be brave enough to actually touch this, um, to be honest. So nimbyism will be there. So that means the more attractive a housing market, like the you know northern suburbs of Sydney or whatever, um, will be the more difficult it is there to find workers. And is there a tipping point? Will this just be legislated? Because these days in Victoria, it's constantly local government areas block stuff, then VCAT comes in, um, the, the big courts essentially then say, no, no, you have no power, uh, we okay it. So therefore, we have this horrible delay in even the, the most um, obvious developments that you should really just, okay, a redevelopment of an absolutely rundown, horrendous shopping center um, just needs to be okay. And it, you need to throw medium or high density housing on top. It's obvious. Mm -hmm. um, but no council will okay it ever. Um, so that's just a bit of a problem. That's what I see in Sydney. Top end of the market will grow, but they need to solve the issue of how do we get staff um, in there, particularly in an environment of super low unemployment, you find a job. You find a job locally. Maybe people, those rich people can just pay for them. If you throw money at a problem, it will always be solved, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. No, very, very interesting insights. And that problem of, you know, the limitations or the hurdles, blocks to getting stuff out of the ground by local government areas or different levels of government. That's a systemic issue, not just in Sydney or, or Melbourne, but I would say in almost all parts of Australia. And one of the reasons why we have a housing crisis in the first instance, a lack of supply, too much tax. We're a huge country um, area wise. We just don't utilize it as efficiently. Yeah as we could but, and of course we got we got hooked on 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 um stamp duties it's just as, as a government if this is such a big fat source of income why would you give up on it 
So yeah. it's rather brave what New South Wales did in, you know, reforming this, ensuring that you can pick or choose land tax um, or, or just uh, an upfront fee, essentially. It's nice. It's pretty, it's, it's a smart way of slowly shifting um, this. So there's a politician, um, Dominic Perrottet in New South Wales, who's at least willing to go down the systemic policy route. That is rather rare. So I applaud him for that. We'll see whether this is enough to actually drive down house prices somewhere near the level of um, affordability because markets are not affordable in international mm -hmm. comparison here. So we need to keep this in mind. Of course, things could get higher uh, prices, but ultimately um, a group called Demographia in the US, they, they measure international housing markets um, against affordability and they just look how many median incomes do you need to buy a median house. If you pay more than five times the median income for a house, for a median house, they call the market severely unaffordable. Sydney costs 15 times the income. <laughs> Melbourne, 12 times. So really, even severe unaffordability unaffor uh, is uh, out, of, out of sight for our major The markets. funny thing is that it was severely unaffordable even five years ago, and yet it still goes up. So it's like, it's really interesting to understand why this is happening, because if we can understand why it's happening, we can hopefully anticipate if it will stop happening in the future. Oh, exactly. You know, like when, when I look at the population forecast for a place like India or China, you know, in let's take China, you know, I think five, 10 years, whatever it is, you know, the population will start going backwards if it hasn't already started. This, India, uh, official figures uh, just this year started. To this year, there you go. And I think India I could be wrong here. You're the expert, not me. But India is like, it's going to happen there as well, but probably in the like 40 years away. In, 40, in 20, 50 years 50. in India. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Something like that. What's the dynamic here? Like, If we strip away immigration, you know, you said before that the forecast suggests we're at 26 million and, you know, 10 years time would be around 30 million, shy of 30 million. If we strip away immigration, is Australia plateauing? Are we going backwards? What's the story there? Is housing only increasing going forward because of immigration? Um, at this rate, it is. Uh, ab absolutely. Um, immigration is, is is a big driver, but we've seen during the um, COVID pandemic, for example, where we lost migrants. Instead of taking in about 200,000 people per year, we lost 90,000 <laughs> um, and house prices went up even more than before. So there is more than more than that. Part of this is, has just to do with the millennial generation. It just happened to coincide that the pandemic hit Australia uh, at the time when the millennials started to have kids. And so we'll have another 12, 15 years worth of millennials making kids and moving from inner city housing to three and four bedroom houses. And that's just the course of life. You add a kid to your house, you add 1.6 kids in Australia to your home. Um, that means you want enough rooms. The one thing everybody needs to compromise, even if you're rich um, in their housing preferences. But the one thing that you're not willing to compromise on in Australia is the number of bedrooms. So we do know that the demand for three and four bedroom dwellings in the next 15 years is going to go absolutely through the roof. Um, also, this happens to coincide that, that millennials wanting those houses and who they could potentially just buy houses from their parents' generation, the baby boomers, but they're not downsizing yet. The whole downsizing movement in Australia really isn't linked to economic considerations or lifestyle considerations. It has to do with the necessity of having to uh, downsize. Australians tell you things like, I want to be carried out of my home. We all live next to an old Italian or Greek widow who lives a very poor and humble life in her quarter acre block house that is by now worth $2 million dollars. She could really Hands up, three million right next door, exactly yeah. profile. <laughs> and um, they could cash in and really, you know, live it up a bit over the last couple of years, but they won't. They will be carried out of the house. And when she dies, her two to three kids will sell the property, make a handsome profit, and share it among them. That's so what's these happening. millennials, right? So maybe this is the last question. This is kind of a morbid question, so forgive <laughs> me. But like, so these people are they're not voluntarily downsizing. The millennials can't afford property. We've already discussed that, especially in the capital cities. When is it that the parents who are asset rich, when is it that according to demographics and you know age studies, when is it that they'll be forced 
to hand down their assets or when will all this inheritance occur and will that solve the affordability issue yeah so if you talk to any financial advisor they could tell you yes of course wealth could be is probably best being handed over to the next generation um, bit by bit while you're still alive you can get tax benefits through this you have control over who gets what whatever that's the smarter way of doing it but it's a terribly awkward conversation to talk about your own death with your kids so you don't do it so that means wealth gets handed down to the next generation um, when the last parent dies that tends to be the mom so we can literally just because women are three years younger in a marriage and they have about three to four years more uh, longer life experience. So all we need to do in our population forecast data is to look at the number of baby boomer women alive and they get smaller every year. So we do know when peak wealth transfer will occur. That'll be right around the year 2041. So millennial peak, a peak baby boomer women will be in uh, death will be in 2041 so that's when we lose them and by then this is about 18 years time from now um millennials that inherit money are well and truly in middle age mm. um they have kids that are finishing up high school or thereabouts yeah. um they they will have a mortgage by then it's too and, late for them right and so what do you do then with the inheritance we just pay off the mortgage a bit maybe you buy an investment property maybe you go on a big trip with the kids or whatever so the the big hand-me-downs from one generation to the next the intergenerational wealth transfer that will only turbocharge the australian property market in, right. in, but it's a bit of an awkward time to come to more wealth in your mid 50s it'd be more handy to come to wealth in your mid 30s but you don't wish your parents to die obviously right. um but so that's a bit of an awkward time and it won't be as sexy. People will not go splurging around on sports cars or anything uh, like this. It'll just further um, inject spending power into the property market. So I'd expect uh, throughout the late 2030s into the mid 2040s that the you just inject more and more spending capacity in the property market. So prices, whatever they were before then, will, <laughs> uh, will go up just a bit more. That's, of course, a bit far away uh, for us just then yeah no that's it's really fascinating i always wondered what you know whether this inequality divide or you know this whole concept of millennials avocado on toast they don't have enough savings whether this will be solved by inheritance you know of course that's not a a, a nice solution but it could be a solution but it doesn't seem like it is a solution you know quick enough in their lifespan it's almost like too too late too little no and it will also increase the division in rich and poor because the poor Australians in her inherent bugger all, whereas the rich people uh, earn even more money. So they have even more spending capacity. That means they further price out the lower income uh, competition in, in the field. And yeah. the rich, um, the rich millennials, they will inherit money that they don't need. So that means money directly skips a generation. They'll just put this somewhere, they store the wealth somewhere and hand it over to their kids. So that means you further enshrine um, rich and poor Australia yeah. through this wealth transfer. This is fascinating. I'm thoroughly having a good time. Hopefully we uh, we can do a second version of this because I've, I've learned so much already, genuinely speaking, you know, especially the, the inequality changing and, and how in the future it's, it's migrants predominantly that are pushing up the housing market. Now, socially, there could be issues or could not be issues, but we're a migrant country. I think the statistic is at least one parent of 50% of Australians was born overseas or something like that, yeah. which is a pretty phenomenal statistics. And that, that's only going to get uh, more and more. And, and maybe next time we can talk about things like, you know, how migrants from a economic benefit to society have a, a larger order of magnitude dollar terms economic benefit than local population. It's just a fascinating discussion, but I think we've probably run out of time this time around, Simon. Um, oh, fantastic. Let's let's do it again anytime. Was there anything um, lastly that you wanted to to share uh, maybe some insights that you're working on um, in your company or how people can find you? Well, so you can find me in the, I have a monthly column in the Australian. I have a weekly column in the New Daily and I am absolutely hyperactive uh, on, on Twitter and on, on Facebook. I run a little page called Simon Shows You Maps. So there's about 500,000 people across Twitter and Facebook who just look at 
daily maps and charts about global data, Australian data, um, whatever uh, I can I can find really. And I have to confess, I forayed into TikTok uh, about six months ago. And I found you on TikTok. It was like the most interesting, <laughs> like, you know, little snippets of charts that are behind you. And it's just like, you know, completely not what TikTok's for, but it was like the most entertaining. I don't know if you're still there, but if you are, people go check Simon out there. <laughs> wow. Fantastic. Appreciate the shout out. All right. Well, thank you so much, Simon. And guys, I hope you got a ton of benefit. I genuinely like so uh, intellectually stimulated um, hearing about this stuff, not only in the property context, but just in the Australian context more, more broadly. Um, I just want to say thank you again, Simon. Anytime.